One question, an amazing lineup of CEOs, founders, and experts. This is Marketing for the Now. Can you hear me? The second. Your 50th. Thank you so much. That made me feel so happy. I love how I feel like you're back. I'm so glad to be here. Who are you? You real? Seek a little. Marketing for not you. Hey, Gary. I don't know why that still makes me laugh. The, the beatboxing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's awesome. I love VCon, it. VCon, 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 it's coming. Is it coming? VCon is coming. Along. We're a month, a uh, little short of a month away. Um, can the big marketing <laughs> festival. I know you and I are working on that. We're in the depths of 2022. Uh, obviously, Vayner Media has been getting a ton of industry accolades. So our new business team is crazy busy. And I know you've been busy interacting with all of the marketers as well. And it's just nice to be back on marketing for the now. Yeah, I know. It's great. We're going to talk We're going to talk about some of those hot takes. We're kind of, yeah, what are we? We're, we're into Q1. We're heading into Q2 big time. So let's, uh, we got a great lineup. We're going to have kick things off with Sophie Bambuck. She's the CMO of Everlane and she's the first ever CMO at Everlane, but she comes from a 13 year career at Nike. And she held roles as CMO of Converse and headed up brands for Nike Sportswear as well. So welcome, Sophie. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Hi, guys. Hi, Sophie. How Hi, are Gary. you? I'm good. I'm good. It's great How to see you. How are you doing? Yeah, oh. same here. <laughs> Let's get right into it. You know, we only have 10 minutes. These things go fast. So what are your hot takes for 2022? In the first kind of three, three and a half months. Give me something that you had a hypothesis going into 2022 on that's working and give me something that in the last 14, 15 weeks is starting to really bounce around in that brilliant marketing head of yours of like, oh man, we need to do more of this or we're not taking this serious or what's that shiny thing over there? Is that, is that just sizzle or is there steak under that sizzle? Yeah. Uh, I don't know about brilliance. Uh, uh, I'll just share what I. <laughs> I'll just share what's in my head. Um, I think the the big thing, and obviously I work at at Everlane, um, and it's not because it's Earth Month or anything, but I think the topic of sustainability is a big one, and I think it's becoming it's ramping up. Um, if you think about how it took like a major event for kind of like DEI efforts to be on everybody's minds. And I don't mean just corporate, like from a brand and marketing standpoint, it became like, what is it that we're saying? What are we doing? I think sustainability is seeing this um, happening. I think it's on everybody's mind. The problem, I think, in my opinion, is that nobody's figured out how to make sustainability sexy. Nobody's figured out how to make it something that is um, honestly interesting. And so it's, it's one of those where you're seeing it more and more. I mean, uh, and obviously I follow sustainability closely, but whether it's media uh, just pushing, you know, through PR, you know, media articles, every brand, every collection, you know, from an apparel standpoint, everybody's coming out with their sustainability take, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I'm sorry to jump in, but yeah. I will tell you, because I do this for a living, when you look at the interests of 18 and under, this is now table stakes. This is not sizzle. Like I, I have a 12 year old daughter. She doesn't even think in the concept of a product. It's a cost of entry. It's almost as if like <clears throat> there's no other perspective. And sure. you obviously your company was such a pioneer, but the companies that are doing, a, you know, this is business life, right? Where you're making mm -hmm. a lot of money, you're not sustainable. If they don't figure that shit out, within this decade, I, I think the market is gonna be very cruel to them. You know, everyone's, everyone's lightweight altruistic in business world about issues that matter. The second the consumer turns on you, you very much, you know, you could be the least earth loving Good. person on earth. The second the consumers only buy if it you is it. Yeah. 100, and, that, and that's yeah. what I keep telling my friends, I'm like, we're now in yellow. This isn't red. We're in yellow and it's about to go green and they're gonna all leave you behind. That's just business talk, not even, hey, let's fucking live on this earth. Totally. We don't have, and, and arguably, I don't think we have 10 years to figure it out. I actually think we've had the past 10 years to figure it out. We haven't figured it out. Now we gotta hurry up and actually get together. And I think the, one of the issue also why it's not getting figured out faster is that everybody's using sustainability as a competitive advantage. 
Mm. Right. So like you're actually looking at here's what I'm doing. Here's my shiny object. Here's why you should come to me where really to actually figure it out. You, it actually requires collaboration because nothing happens in isolation when you have a brand new concept or, or idea. And so, but you're totally right. I mean, I think I just saw a report recently that was just saying that um, brand name, you know, there's still a lot of retailers who assume that brand name um, uh, have more value uh, in the consumer eyes nowadays, where actually we're seeing that consumers are starting to value product sustainability over brand name. Like there's a transition starting to happen, but you're definitely to your point, like you're definitely seeing it much more in that younger audience. A lot of Everlane's consumer is still, you know, millennials. And I mean, they've been on it for a while, but it was like a nice to have versus a must have. That younger audience, it's a must have. So you have to figure it out. Um, and maybe in a way it's a hot take, but a hot topic for 2022, but also like, uh, and ask, uh, we all need to get on it together because otherwise we're never going to figure it out. Like it's, it's hard to figure out on your own. Let's, let's talk about the marketing of it. You know, I was just in the discord while you were talking, talking to my friend, homie in the V friends discord. I'm looking at what's going on on TikTok. You know, when you're running a business where, you know, the data is so clear under 25, under 30, I've got an audience that's fully bought into what I'm saying for the last seven minutes, over 35, there's a percentage, and as you get older, and so we're going through this thing. Not that the OGs don't remember Earth Day, they went crazy on Earth Day back in the day, but you know, it is, it is that. What do you think about, from a marketing standpoint, getting that message out for some of the new stuff? How do you think about Discord? How do you think about TikTok? Where are you and the brand on that journey? Yeah, we're, we're scratching the surface, I think, um, but we're getting in it. I think TikTok has the opportunity. TikTok is a great place to educate people. TikTok is where you get all your tips. TikTok is where you're getting like, I mean, I just learned how to like make a dish on TikTok like recently. It's just like, it's one of those where, and I'm obviously older, so I used to maybe TikTok a little bit differently, but it's a place where you can actually and educate, go and educate. The dilemma right now, I think, I really think cancel culture is hurting everybody. This idea, you know, I think cancel culture is making everybody avoid risk because there's an expect expectation that we're at perfection and that, you know, progress yeah. doesn't need to, and experimentation think, doesn't need to happen. You think the overaggressive canceling, even on subtle things, is creating an overreaction to just vanilla work? A hundred percent. It's It's the danger we're in right now. It's in order to succeed, you have to try and you have to be okay failing. And right now, failing is no longer accepted um, in some parts. And, and I think yep. that's the danger of cancel culture. It's like, if you're not perfect, you could get where canceled. Companies, is not companies perfect. Have a, yeah, where companies have a real tough time. You know, so for example, as a personal brand, and I know that, I have a big audience as a human being, yeah. I'm, I take a ton of risks. But the reason I do is because I know my intent. Right? I know my intent, totally. which means... God forbid if I misstep, which for somebody who speaks so much, I've done pretty well because of my intent. Yeah. But if I do, I'm incredibly capable of saying I'm sorry as a human being. And yeah. I've done that the last 15 years publicly when I've had to. I think for brands, brands also often do have good intent. A lot of times not, yeah. but a lot of times more so than, you know, I'm under the hood now for the last 13 years. It's not like they're trying to do the worst shit of all time. No, the problem is people. when, <laughs> that's right. The problem is they suck at I'm sorry. Yeah. They yeah, I think suck at I'm sorry. Like, and transparency, I, like transparency is so important. It's like, here's why we did this. Um, and here's why we did this. And here's why we're not there yet. Or here's why we failed. Um, like actually like last, last year we had this whole thing around like the last percent. We're almost there on no longer using virgin plastic, but we're not all the way there because we haven't figured everything out. And you have to be honest, you have to be transparent, you have to be authentic, um, and your mission has got to be, like, it can't just be a display for the consumer. It's got to be something you live and breathe as a company and actually kind of, like, do everything uh, for. And to your yeah, point, I, think I, don't, I just don't do that. Yeah, I, I, a lot of companies are confused as if they have to be perfect. I keep telling yeah. people, if you look carefully, if it, it's okay to be like, yo, we sell this shit. Like, it's actually okay. It's when you try to make pretend you're not selling this shit and you're like, yo, I'm da da da. But you're like, that's where people get crazy. Yeah, totally. 
I mean, it's also it's also when people start uh, virtue signaling others when they're vulnerable and sustainability. I have so many friends who are passionate about it, which makes me passionate about it. I'm passionate about it. But what I don't do is shit on everybody for every move because when I have friends who shit on everybody for it, I'm like, well, what about what the plane you took? Like literally yeah, have wealthy friends who try to shit on people for sustainability while flying private planes all around the country when they don't <laughs> always have yeah. You know, and yeah. so I think hypocrisy is a devastating blow. For sure. And it, it, again, I think everybody that is touching, that's what I shouldn't say, a lot of people who are in the sustainability space really are there for the right reasons and it's the right intention. I think it's, everybody needs to get in it. Everybody needs to have um, a point of view at least and be able to respond to it so that they don't get left behind. Like every brand now has to have some sort of responsibility to it. And it's really about figuring out how to make it interesting and simple for the consumer to understand it. Cause I mean, it's major science and it's complex. So we have to boil it down to the essential and to, we need to figure out how to make it sexy. Agreed. Yeah. So thanks for being on the show, continued success. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you, Sophie. So Gary, next up we have Gretchen Rubin. She is one of my favorites. She is my podcast girl crush. She's an expert on habits, happiness, and human nature. She's a three times New York Times bestselling author, a blogger, a speaker, and she just received nominations for two Webby Awards. Welcome, Gretchen. Hello, I'm so happy to be talking to you today. Hey, Gretchen. Hey. Um, let's go right into it. Short 10 minutes. What are your hottest takes with consumer behavior in 2022? What are you seeing? One of the things I'm seeing is I think people are very focused on our five senses. I think we've been, you know, distanced from each other. We've been behind screens. We haven't been showing up. And people I see are just hungry. They want to touch. They want to taste. They want to smell. They want to, like, feel those air currents between them and other people. They want to show up. They want to be in person. And I think anything that offers kind of this tactile, physical, concrete experience gets people very excited, whether it's, like, like I had a taste party for a bunch of friends and I just had a bunch of like weird tastes for us all to experiment with, or like, here are the three kinds of apples, like, you know, rate them, um, a planetarium, um, a museum exhibit that is a, like that experiments with sound, um, you know, in, in immersive, like how many things now, right? That's like the word everybody's using is immersive, but that's because it's irresistible. We're so hungry to show up that I think that that is driving a lot of what pe what people are looking for. Let's keep building up. I'm gonna go back to that. What else? What else is, uh, or, or double clicking into details on that. Um, what, what else? There's so many entrepreneurs watching right now that are trying to figure right. out where's the opportunity. There's a lot of parents on here. What's the opportunity for right. happiness? What, are you, what, what other things are you seeing knowing that this is what you spend well, your time and energy? Well, another thing that I'm seeing that's sort of like a less joyful and happy, but also very important to our happiness and health and productivity and creativity is habit formation. You know, everybody is because of this magic, a massive disruption that we've all experienced. And we're sort of coming out of that disruption, but things are not going back to the way they were. A lot of people are having very different um, work looks very different, how they show up, when they show up. And I think just traditionally, a lot of us ever since, you know, we went to kindergarten, we kind of a five day, two day way of setting up our lives. We did certain things during the week. We did certain things during the weekend. This is how we exercise. This is what time we went to bed. This is how we ate. These are the snacks that we had. This is just the rhythm of our family life, our friend life, our work life. And, you know, now this is all just getting turned upside down for many people. So like, yeah, maybe your kid goes, you know, to fourth grade five days a week, but yeah. you do you not go to the that? office. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Gretchen. Uh, no, on, on that, I have a really interesting back to behavior and all that. Do you feel, because it's a profound point what you just made, do you feel that the way we are trained up in school for behavior should now start to be talked about a little bit more because it makes people incredibly non-adaptable in a world where the speed in which the world is moving because of the internet and the blockchain is so profoundly different than the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 
Do you think that there needs to be a bigger conversation of how many people go through the structured school system to the detriment of their adulthood? Well, I would actually zoom it back even more. And I don't even think it's about the school system. I think it's much more individual. And one of the things I spend a lot of time is like thinking about how different people respond differently. Some people really flourish in structure and they need outer accountability and that's how they thrive and that's what they need and that's fine. Other people yep. resist accountability. They don't want someone looking over their shoulder. They don't want someone micromanaging them. They, want, they do better when they have a lot of freedom, when they're choosing what they wanna do. Gary, I think I have an instinct about which category you're fitting into. Um, well, it's, it's so actually, think, it's, it's funny though, it, when you were delivering the sentence and to your point, it, I actually think the first version is fake accountability, right? Like I actually obsess over accountability so much. Like I adore accountability. And, but when it's, when it's a, where, the, where you're accountable to a structure for the sake of the structure, it's like having meetings for the sake of meetings. If the mm. KPI is the meeting, not the actual thing, the whole thing's fucked. Okay, well, I just have to say, if people want to take a quiz and find out where they fit into to a framework that does this, they can go to my website and look for Gretchen Rubin Four Tendencies Quiz because I have so many thoughts about this. But I think like, I would talk about outer accountability. Like some people need outer right. accountability. They need a work deadline. They need somebody to be answerable to. If they're going to work out, they need to work out with a friend or a trainer or whatever, or they need a deliverable yep. or they need a customer or a client. And some people don't need that. And I don't think that it's better or worse to need it or not need it. It's more a question of like, well, what do you need? What do you need and how do you thrive? Right. And the fact is because of the way it was set up, a lot of us just like, if we needed that, we could just plug into a typical office environment. And it gave us, whether we wanted that or not, we got it. For some people yeah. that was great, for some people that was terrible. And now those people are thriving because they're out, they have this freedom and flexibility they've always sought and maybe couldn't get. But then there are yeah. some people who are like, wow, I miss what I had. I need to replace what I had. And if I don't understand what I need, I might not set myself up for success. Or if I'm managing a team, I might not understand different team members need different things. We got to rethink this. We got to recreate it. What does that look like? I couldn't agree more. I, I love that point. I, you know, it would be so much more exciting if we stood up self-awareness and built that up. I mean, to me, it's been the foundation of my happiness. Fuck yes. success, the way the world, to me, success is a mental game, not the tangible items you can buy with fucking money. And I think, to, to your point, the question becomes, what do we do with the half of the 50% of people, 30% of people that are being pushed through a system and a modern parenting infrastructure that tells them they're not doing well? Where's the options? For, you know, being an 18 or 22 year old to finally find that freedom after a machine or a culture has told you you're not gonna be great is great for the ability to deal with negative feedback, but for a lot of people that don't have a parenting infrastructure that builds up their self-esteem to fight the world, they believe the world. No, I, I just think you're so right that what we need is insight into how people are different from each other. And instead of saying like, okay, there's this procrastinate bed, everybody's got to jam their way in. It's the best way. It's the right way. It's the only way. It's the way we've done it. It's to say, hey, different people need different things. How do we get people what they need? And maybe that's going to take some experimentation because you 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 want to, you try this, you try that. Maybe something works. Maybe something sounds great, doesn't work for you. But instead of having this assumption that there's one right way, that if we could just find it or force everybody to do it, because what a lot of people do is they say, well, this works for me. So that's going to work for you. No, why? No. You're a morning person, I'm a night person. I love simplicity, yeah. love abundance. You like to sprint, I'm a marathoner. There's and, no right and, way, no wrong way. And giving people permission to evolve. I mean, it's, you know, yeah. who I'm at 16 and 32 and 44 are three different versions of myself and yeah. giving us the opportunity to breathe a little bit and feel comfortable within our own skin as we progress is profound. I, I, I wanna go back to, an incredible insight you started this with. I love this sensory thing. I think there's, you know, back to making this maybe a little bit about business and less about societal norms. Um, I think for the people that heard that and can dig into you a little bit more on your site and your socials here for people that I wanna follow, I think you're very much onto something on the sensory part. People definitely are yearning 
I mean, look, there's a lot of COVID going on right now and the collective society's like, we're, we're done. Like we're tired, we're gonna like, like we're struggling, which is a, you know, we're struggling to accept it and kind of just trying to push through it, which also equals to me a very real validation of your hypothesis that you started here with or your observations that you're seeing. I think sensory is a big opportunity for 2022 and 23. Well, and look at your conference. Like it's, it's people are flooding into it. People want to be in person. They want to show up. They want to be with other people. Um, I think that that desire to show up and to travel, to experience is going to be kind of irresistible, as you say, sort of like people are like, I got, I, 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 I want it. Yeah. Gretchen, continued success. Great to see you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Gretchen. Gary, next we bring up Rachel Tipograph, founder and CEO of Micmac, a global e-commerce enablement and analytics platform for brands. And we've known uh, Rachel for a while, but before she, she founded Micmac, Rachel was at Gap as the company's youngest ever global director of digital and social media. And after she left Gap, she traveled the world for 100 days before she came, gave birth to this new company. Welcome, Rachel. Hi. Hey, Hi, Gary. Rachel. How's it going? Things are well. Um, as many of my most intense hardcore fans know, I adore this woman. She is someone I give a lot of public roses to because I love sitting on her board and interacting with her and I cheer for her. And I am always thirsty for more opportunities to hang out with Rach. How are you? I'm great. I'm in the office. It's I like see that. 2019 here. Uh, well, um, so appreciate your support. Thank you. Um, let's go into it. What are you seeing? I mean, I think you're one of the stronger observers. That's why I'm a fan. Um, and, uh, and I would love to hear your first 15, 16 weeks into the year insight around e-commerce, big brands and e-commerce influencers or anything else you've decided to uh, get uh, intrigued by. Yeah. Um, so for context, you know, my business, we work with CPG brands anywhere ranging from 50 billion in revenue to 50 million. And so I thought, Gary, you and I could talk about retail media. So, yeah. you know, when I started Micmac going on seven years ago, retail media represented anywhere between five and 20% of brands budgets. Today, any customer I talk to, it's anywhere between 50 and 75%. And the reason why is that in many ways, it's guaranteed ROI. You give Amazon yeah. a dollar, they know exactly who to go and target. Now, the challenge with retail media historically is that there hasn't been enough supply, right? There's only so many people that you can reach within Amazon.com, Target.com, Walmart.com. And so yep. what's happened over the last 18 months is the retail media groups have recognized this. And they're starting to try to figure out how do I create more supply? So you see like Walmart teaming up with the trade desk. What's also happening right now in the ecosystem that's causing retail media to rise is the changes that have happened between what I like to call Apple, Google, and Facebook. You know, industry headlines talk about a movement towards consumer data privacy. I don't really think it's about that. I think that yep. Apple woke up one day realized that they weren't monetizing traffic within their phone, that their biggest competitors were monetizing that. And so Apple said, how do I make Google and Facebook's life a lot more difficult and fundamentally change the way that all of us have to go to market, which is it is so difficult now to essentially execute the playbook that you know Gary, you and I grew up with, which was the ability to remarket to someone on the internet because it takes multiple touch points to close a sale. That's right. And Re remarketing through cooking people's browsers or phones or things of that nature. And the ad showing up a third, a fourth, a fifth time, you were in a shopping cart, you let it sit, you go somewhere else to ESPN, all of a sudden there it is again. You're like, all right, fuck, boom. And that the data showed that that was an incredibly effective way to get it closed. And then you just run the math on how much all those ads cost you versus the profit you made against the thing. And away we go. Exactly. Sales. Now, you know, that I think sales, right? Which kind of actually reached in a lot of ways, killed marketing creativity in a lot of ways because everyone became so CAC and LTV'd out. And 
it could be really interesting. You know, I think about um, donuts. Mm-hmm. I love them. Mm-hmm. A donut can be dry and I and still delicious, and I think of that as sales. It's still a donut. It's good, mm-hmm. but you give me a moist, soft donut that like yep. melts in your mouth. That's brand. That's marketing, and that tastes even more delicious. You're absolutely right, but because people have become so reliant on essentially a dollar in equals a dollar fifty out of return, they're now leaving environments like Facebook and they're moving into retail media. But there's a challenge right now, and this is this is sort of what I'm feeling in the ecosystem over the last 16 weeks, which is that retail media is where social media was in 2009. So it is completely siloed. Yep. There is no standardization, very few self-serve tools, and it is really painful. So if you talk to CPG brand manufacturers, they don't love talking about retail media. First reason why is that more and more power is shifting to the retailers. So global supply chain crisis, rising prices in fuel, like it kind of sucks right now to sell consumer products. It's more expensive than ever before. The retailers recognize this. They need to be able to offset their margins. Best way to do that is with advertising, because guess what we learned? Advertising is a great business. And so they're being squeezed for dollars, but then it is so painful to execute. There's gaps in reporting and there's no standardization. And so one of the things that I feel really strongly about, and I'm talking with all the advocacy groups in our industry, ANA, IAB, like, There needs to be a new dialogue around creating standardization in retail media so everyone can scale together. Now, playing this out for you, what I think is about to happen is retail media, it will scale, it'll reach that $100 billion that BCG talks about, and then it'll become inefficient. And then people are going to start to swing back towards brand. So they're going to go back to Facebook, they're going to go to Snap but then the attribution isn't going to be there. And that's, that's going right. to be the next conversation. A hundred percent. And what I'm most passionate about is I love marketing and sales. And back to my donut analogy, marketing has left the room because the only marketing is television commercials. And that's the worst garbage on earth in 2023. Mm-hmm. Not watch network television commercials. And so we have this incredible opportunity to start building brand and social through brand work that is not measurable the same way that these brands want. And they have to start having a better conversation of understanding, it's like a fighter in MMA. You got a left hand, you got a right hand. So many people are trying to fight with just one hand and which hand is it? And boy, oh boy, is it a wild matrix out there right now. But I think, Gary, I know you're super passionate about it and I I understand you know, everything that you're saying, but that's internally at these organizations, marketing and sales, it's moving closer together. It's actually being that's, centralized. By the way, that's great. The problem, that's not the, I mean, that's phenomenal because that's business. Go ahead. Right. But what, but the KPI is becoming more and more sales and less and less brand but, every day. By the, by the way, which is actually fantastic. What nobody understands yet is, Sales is just bad marketing. <laughs> meaning, meaning, yep. there you go. Meaning, yep. that's very lovely. I sold almost a million dollars worth of ReFriends hoodies, not because I fucking cookied all these people in the chat, but because yep. I built brand. Brand is sales. These fuckers did not cookie my phone. Mm-hmm. They did this. And I think, to your point, and by the way, I love it because I love doing digital sales to give me air cover to do proper digital branding. I think the, the, the challenge with these brands is that still, which is just crazy to me, you know, I've been doing this part of the industry for 15 years. They still rely on these media mix models to essentially spit out how much revenue do we drive? And it just comes down to that conversation. Bullshit reports. You know what it reminds me of? This. You know what this is? <laughs> What, your first your first sale? What? Oh, your high school, your secondary school report card. I, my high school report card. You know what I call this? A bullshit report. You want to hear one? You want to hear one, Rach? Let's hear it. Sophomore, sophomore year, speech. 
It's right there. Speech. Yep. You see it? You do. Speech. Yep. You see it? C P D. Nope. Oh, you got a D. Wow. I got a D in speech. Yeah, it's amazing. What else do you fucking want to know about bullshit reports? Yeah, yeah no, I, I totally understand. Um, so anyway, I, I think your point's taken. And I think for, for a lot of people, because these are all so short and I got to move the show along. Rachel has consistently, I invested. Rachel, how fast did I invest in your company in our first meeting? Honestly. Three minutes. Three minutes. Say it for everybody one more time. Three minutes. How many years later are we here? Seven and a half. Seven and a half years ago, in three minutes of conversation, I wrote a check into Rachel's company. Why? Because I had an intuition that has been proven very, very true in the last seven and a half years, which is this woman's ability to adjust to the reality of the marketplace is real. And I have that so I can sense it and very few people have it. If you're interested in what Rachel's talking about here, which is absolutely 1000% true, on the concept of big brands moving a lot of their media dollars into the Walmarts and the Targets and the other retailers, media offerings, there's a ton of innovation and business and opportunity in there. And I highly recommend you get very close to the things that she's writing about, podcasting about. You can learn something. You'll probably ask her for a job on your second piece of content consumed. And if nothing else, it's just good for you to know her. Thank you, Thanks, Gary. Rachel. Appreciate your time. Cheers. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Gary, for putting in the time. All, the, all kinds of chat going on. And how does he do it all? How is he How is he working on VCon and he's jumping on this show? I'll tell you how. Because I didn't respect the system. Because I said, fuck this system. That's why. Because this system told me to do one thing. This system told me to do one thing. And I told the system they were wrong. They are wrong. You're so much more than a C plus. You're an A plus plus plus. Thank you, Gary. I would have taken a I would have taken a C plus, by the way, on the record. I would have taken it. Just to, just to zoom in here. Just to remind. That's right. Do you see the GPA? Look at the class rank. Tell me what I can't see it, Gary, honestly. My class rank was 243 out of 254. I was the I was the eleventh. 12th worst student in the entire class. I had a 1.67 GPA. Oh my God. Yeah. And now, and now look what you are. And that's why you're revolutionizing everything. And the best part is, you know, what's, you know, the look where I am now has nothing to do with the business success. What, what I really learned in high school was that I was not willing to go to the final level of popularity by compromising my kindness in high school to be the super most popular you have to be willing to pick on people. That was just a culture. And I wasn't willing to compromise that. And so what I really learned at high school and look at who I am now is I'm a nice person. And that was the, and to be able to go through high school and deal with peer pressure at that level and not compromise your soul and your kindness is the thing I'm most proud about. Not the fact that I became a very good businessman with bad grades. Yeah, and we're so lucky to be at Vayner where you've been able to give that gift um, in such a major way. I mean, we just we the fact that we can scale an organization because people love each other and they trust each other um, first and they do great work and they do it fast because of it is it's real. I, I didn't believe there was a company out like that anywhere, but uh, you found it. But I found it. I love it. We'll talk love to you. you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're gonna bring up our CEO of Gallery Media Group, Ryan Harwood. How's yeah. it going, Ryan? It's been oh, too long, too long. I'm excited, ready to go. I'm so excited too. We're gonna to bring up Rob Master of Unilever. He's the VP of Media and Marketing, and he leads all so much media, in, innovation, strategy, integrated co communications for all of Unilever's brands. And check this out. Under Rob's leadership, Unilever has been recognized as Digital Marketer of the Year by Advertising Age, a Media Client of the Year by Media Post, and one of the Fast, fast Company's Most Innovative Marketers. Wow. Welcome, Rob. How are you doing? Great to be here. Great to be here. How's it going, Rob? Take a moment just like just to like reflect on Gary Vee. 
I mean, I, I've known Gary for actually oh, well over a decade and just to see the growth, I mean, just so much fun, so much energy. So, so, so thank you for having me uh, on the show today. This is great. Absolutely. Did you, did you do well in school, Rob? I mean, I, I was like a middle middling student. I, I wasn't like Gary V level, but I certainly wasn't like Ivy league level. I was, I'm a big 10 guy. So, you know, yeah. I, you know, it's funny. I, as Gary's partner, I debate him on this all the time that, you know, he says grades don't matter. I say grades matter that you should try if you can try. We get into it all the time, but I respect his opinion and I, I totally get it. But I am pumped to have you on the show, Rob. For everybody, Rob is a long time friend and colleague. He runs media and marketing at Unilever and he is a legend in the industry. So I'm pumped to have him on. Um, you know, 2022 has fully arrived. Let's talk about what you're seeing. The other day you mentioned to me streaming wars was something that was going through your head. We know that Netflix was the early dominant player, but they have a lot of competition now. Tell me what's going on in your head there. Yeah, so I think tw yeah, 2022 will be the year of the streaming war. I think it's actually an unbelievably exciting and competitive landscape to watch from the sidelines, um, although we certainly have a major role to play in it. Um, but I think it's interesting. We reflect on Netflix. As you said, they were the longtime player – they really had no direct competition for almost like a decade. Uh, of course, there was Hulu, but Hulu was kind of an aggregator. I think in 2022, Netflix faces, I think, two kind of competitors. The first is kind of the traditional media companies, the Paramounts, the Disneys, the Warner Discovery merger. And these guys are all in. I mean, they're retaking back their content, whether it be The Office or Friends. So they're taking it from Netflix. Yep. They're, they're creating enormous amount of original content development that they're putting on their streaming platforms. They're getting, they're all in on marketing. They're thinking about the consumer in a different way than they've ever thought before. And I think if you look at their user interfaces, they're really good. Yep. Um, I think that, as, you know, they're, they're really solid. They're good, they're good experiences. And for them, I think it's interesting. The Disney's, the Warner's, this is a burning platform for these guys. This, this is like, they, they can't see anything more than Netflix. I think they kind of let Netflix go on for too long, but now they're all in. And so while it's not a zero sum game because people will have multiple subscriptions, I think it's an area they have to win and win big. The other competitor, so you have the, the traditional kind of media companies. The other competitor is a totally different ball game. You have probably the two most powerful companies in the world and Apple and Amazon. And so it doesn't necessarily their core business. And I'm not sure if it's a hobby or a loss leader or what they're thinking about, but it's certainly part of their overall business strategy. And I think, you know, that's a different set of competitors than the Disney's and the Warner's. And so I look at Netflix and I think, um, you know, they're competing for consumers now in a different way, but more importantly, I think for their business model, they're competing for content with Disney and with Amazon and Apple. And I yeah. think that's a totally different like, cost model for them. And they have a single revenue stream. And I just, I think you're beginning to see signs of that rev that, that that business model crack because you know yes. you know Apple's like in the hardware business. Amazon sells web services and soap, yep. and you know they have all these other revenue streams as is, you know as Disney. So I think I think the Netflix model will definitely have to change. Is my is my perspective? How does how does this the streaming wars affect a company like Unilever? Like given that you can't advertise on a lot of these platforms. But like, how does it consume your your headspace in the integrated marketing and media world? Where do you fit into this world? Yes, yeah, so I think you know we're obviously watching very closely yeah. um, the transition from like traditional television, which is still like you know provides some big numbers, but to streaming and and so we're very supportive of these ad supported models like like HBO Ooh. Max and Paramount Ooh. Plus and Hulu. These guys are an important part of our mix because. It's, I think it's a great consumer experience. I mean, in the end, I think we're going to have so many subscriptions. We're going to rue the day that we forgot about the cable bundle to some degree. But that's a whole different conversation. But I, I do think that for us, we're really looking at innovative and creative ways to leverage these streaming platforms, which are almost like a reset, yeah. like innovative ads, targeting, audience. Like there's just so much you could do in streaming that you can't do in linear. And frankly, yeah. you can't necessarily do in social because – like we're talking about terrific, like amazing content. Not that TikTok doesn't have great content or Facebook, but I think this high quality content and associating yourselves with it is a huge opportunity for yeah. brands like ours. And by the way, doing it innovatively. Yeah, it also allows you to, to put out a high volume of various ad, var variety of ads. So it's not one vanilla piece of content that goes on linear and you're hoping and praying that resonates. Now you can 
do a lot of different variations. So I'm excited for that as well. Oh, totally, totally. Talk to me about um, the conversions of, of media and commerce. You know, this reminds me of how athletes wanted to be musicians and musicians wanted to be athletes and now they all want to be entrepreneurs. It seems like media companies want to be commerce companies, commerce companies want to be media companies. What are you seeing here? So first of all, I love that kind of metaphor analogy. I think it's it's great that we came right after Rachel and Gary because I think I think what we're seeing is this convergence of media and and commerce take place at such a force, and really I think it was accelerated uh, accelerated by the COVID experience. And listen, I get it. If I'm a retailer, you're looking at the media business. It's a great business. It's a high margin business. And by the way, retailers have great data. And I think if you just start looking at some of the, the market caps and the story, it tells a clear story. Like look at like Snapchat, where they have a couple thousand employees and their market cap is significantly bigger than someone like Kroger, who's the largest yeah. grocer in America, has probably yeah. a half a million employees. And, you know, you know, that's a totally different kind of margin business. They got real estate, they got logistics, they have weather, they got Karen's going wild in stores. I mean, it's a totally different experience versus Snap. So I think, yes, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in the retail space. I look at with envy for the media business. And, and to your point, I think the media guys are see upside in being in the commerce business. And so I think for good reason. Um, you know, one is it's a way for them to enhance their consumer experience by either keeping people uh, frictionless in buying products, experiencing products on their site, spending more time. By the way, more time on their site means more ads. By the way, they could sell ads that are like specializing in kind of like shoppable so they can charge a higher price for that. Um, and the other part is I think um, it's a, another revenue stream. So TikTok's getting into this Facebook, they're getting into kind of like commission based sales. So I think this convergence is coming from both ends. Again, the brands are going to be important for us to play an important role. You know, we talk about the retail media players, you know, we got to make sure that they're operating like media, media players with similar standards and ways of working than the rest of the media industry. Everyone loves uniqueness. That's cool. But we got to make sure that like, can our ads be seen by humans in safe environments? Can they be third party measured? These are the things that retailers really going to have to embrace. But overall, we're really excited about this convergence. Awesome. Um, this is a short 10 minutes we get. So I want to jump into the third area that I, I'd love your hot take on is is name image likeness with college athletes. Has, has Unilever dabbled in this sector at all? Yeah, so just to give some context. So this name image likeness is a space that essentially the context here is that on July 1st, college athletes were able to profit from their name image and likeness and went live July 1st. And actually we were the first major advertiser to jump in. We've been a long time NCAA sponsor. So we've been watching this space closely, very supportive of athletes getting involved. And you know, we looked at it as an opportunity to like, have a thoughtful precedent. It's just not all about like the top quarterback in the country, the number one draft pick in basketball. We really were looking for a diverse set of athletes across the spectrum of sports to bring this to life. Yeah. Um, and about 10 months in, it's actually as much as we tried setting a precedent to be productive and not just hawking products and thinking purpose and diversity, we're seeing kind of like a, a bit of the Wild West, a lot of predominantly football, whether it be Texas A&M or University of Texas, doing a lot of kind of like Interesting things in air quotes, I think, with how they're how they're getting involved with uh, college athletes, which I think is a bit of a concern. Um, and uh, it's something that we're, we're certainly watching closely. But our program, we launched with degree, our brand degree, and with this whole purpose around breaking limits. So we brought in 19 student athletes, um, wonderful kids from across sports, race, socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, sexual orientation, geography. And like we brought them in. 10 women, nine men, and we had them tell their stories about how they broke limits, very much tied with our purpose. Yeah. And so it was like an amazing experience, amazing uh, kids. And what's great about it, we didn't just start, stop there, we actually did mentorships with them because the reality is most college athletes are not gonna make their living through the sport. So we work with a number of them now as, as mentors. So I have a great kid named Chase Griffith. He's a, he's a um, UCLA quarterback. Um, yeah. not the starter. I'm surprised uh, you didn't do all Wisconsin players. So we actually have, we have a, we have a bunch of Wisconsin players. We have a terrific kid who's a computers, like engineering major. We partnered him with our head of supply chain, one of our heads of supply chain who also played sports at West Point. So it's an amazing experience to like connect with these kids. And I think it's a, provides a lot of energizing and uh, passion for us as well. We got to, we got to wrap. We're at time. I'm going to go real quick on the speed round questions. Okay. My patent here, salty or sweet, Rob? 
It's a tough one between cashews and gummy bears. I'm, I'm going to go with gummy bears. 80s or 90s music? I mean, you got Thriller and Molly Crew. I'm going all 80s. 80s. Sly Stallone or Arnold Schwarzenegger? I got Balboa and Rambo. No okay. question. Last one, Friends or Seinfeld? I think ultimately in 15 years, I'll be living in Del, Cabo, Del Boca Vista. So there you go. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Rob. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me. Take care. Thanks, Ryan. You're, we got to get you your own show just with that one, with those rapid fire <laughs> questions. They're the best. I love Thanks it. Thanks so much you. for joining us, Ryan. We'll see you soon. All right. Next up, we've got our executive director of the Sasha Group, Mickey Cloud. Hey, Andre, how are you? Oh, I love it. Love it. A little got this, outdoor Got the screen in porch life. Nice, nice, nice. So we're super fired up to have a conversation between you and Kevin Miller, who's the CMO of, the, of Fresh Market. Kevin has been an industry disruptor for a long time. He's got a 30-year career. He's worked with a ton of Fortune 100 companies. I'm going to rattle a few of them off. Uh, Natural Grocers, Pizza Hut, Subway, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, and more. And I think most importantly, we really want to thank Kevin uh, and his family for his service in the military. Welcome, Kevin. All righty. Happy to be here, guys. Hey, Kevin. How are you? All right. How are you doing, Mickey? Doing great. Super excited to have you on Marketing for the Now. You know, we know just hearing those brands that Andre rattled off, your entire career has kind of been at the intersection of food and retail. Um, and so as you, you know, are a quarter into 2022, what's kind of the number one hot take most macro priority for, you know, uh, retail businesses and, and how does that apply to kind of your grocery world and with the fresh market? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, a little bit about the fresh market first, you know, we're not as famous as uh, Unilever, but we're doing okay. <laughs> so we're, uh, we're a $2 billion brand. We have 149 stores in, uh, in 20 States and the fresh market was, 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 uh, founded on the idea of providing, you know, the best food, fresh food from around the world curated uh, to our customers and given the best service. And so for us, you know, our product quality is very important, but the actual experience of shopping at the fresh market is equally important to our customers. In fact, we have a much higher elevated expectation. Our customers expect us to provide the same level of service as a Nordstrom's or you know, a Ritz Carlton. It's not just a little bit better they expect, but they expect a whole lot better <laughs> experience and a whole lot better level of, of impeccable service. So that is really an important aspect as you look at all the, you know, the movement toward technology and, you know, the the impact of, of COVID and inflation. And there are a number of things that are going on out there that, uh, you know, keep me up at night. I'll just name a few. Jimmy sure. Fallon style. Uh, yeah. Are you ready? All right. <laughs> Fidgetal. <laughs> the, the, the physical world colliding with the digital world. Hey, Love if that. you don't get this right, we'll turn into marketing dinosaurs. <laughs> Next. Web 3.0 is happening in 2022. Well, 3.0, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm still working on web 1.0. Now I have to get to the 3.0. Next. I think we heard it on a couple other ones. Live, Live commerce. commerce. I didn't know commerce was dead. All right. <laughs> I love this Jimmy the, the Jimmy Fallon bit here. Okay, here we go. All right, what's the last one? Well, I got a couple more. Okay. Metaverse. Metaverse. Mm -hmm. That's important because Zuckerberg said it is. <laughs> All right. Non fungible tokens, NFTs. Yeah. That's hard to read. Yeah. Because it's hard <laughs> to understand, too. All right. Well, all this is kind of adding up for us and for me is was predicted by James and Elizabeth 30 years ago. And that the more technology we introduce into society, the more people will aggregate, will want to be with each other, other people, movies, rock concerts, and shopping. Mm -hmm. That's high tech, high touch. And we all seen it. We all talked about it. It's like people are tired of being on Zoom. Mm -hmm. People are tired of wearing masks. And whenever anyone attends a conference, they're very happy just to see other people. And so how do you make that experience of high tech, high touch, 
you know, come to life against all the various platforms, against all the different customers, all the different shopping ex experiences. That is really our challenge for 2022 and beyond. I love that because, I mean, as a uh, as a shopper at the Fresh Market, but and as someone who grew up in the state of North Carolina where you guys are based, it that shopping experience it is a vibe, right? Like only classical music playing. You've got the fresh flowers, the fresh fruit. You 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 get that Zen like experience when you are physically in in that in in the store in the location. How do you translate that experience? For a shopper that wants to order on Instacart, that wants to do curbside delivery, that wants to do the e-com side of the business, and, and and how do you make sure that you're still hitting that sensorial experience for someone that's shopping digitally? Yeah, so you got all those platforms and technologies we just talked about, but the where you have to start is with the, you know, with the brand and really understanding your brand, your brand DNA, and your brand promise better than anyone else. Um, and from that, you need to develop a brand vision. So our brand vision is to become one of America's most loved brands. And that's because we're leaning into Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> human spirit and love. The human spirit and love. It's just that simple. And so by anchoring our business into pleasing our customers with impeccable guest service, with the highest quality products they can find anywhere, and providing that with a sense of love and passion, then we have to then translate that feeling, that tone to the right customer at the right place at the right time. And we've all said that before, but here's the additional kicker in the right way, mm -hmm. in the way that they want to receive our message and our storytelling on the devices they want to receive it in a time when they want to consume that content. And so you have to invest with working with very smart people and organizations and partners like the Sasha Group to help, you know, translate that brand experience, that brand promise, that level of expectations that the customer expects of you into these platforms where they are, where, where they're living. Love so that. That's, that's not a uh, something you can solve overnight. Yep. It's something that, that you have to work on and experiment with constantly. It goes back to what Gary was talking about with Rachel earlier about how its brand is ultimately going to be the thing that unlocks the sales. And so I love that for, you know, as you guys have started to think about that with the curbside pickup experience and kind of the concierge level of that's not just a, okay, I'm going to drop it off and you've got to come in and walk it. Talk, can you talk a little bit about how that's, how you guys are thinking yeah. about that? Yep. So that goes back to, again, you know, walking the talk, really understanding who your brand is and what your customers expect of you. So we um, we knew that going into the um, holiday selling season of 2022, uh, 2020, excuse me, that that was the first year for COVID. Yep. Uh, the first holiday impacted by COVID. And we knew that COVID wasn't over. In fact, it was surging in that, you know, curbside would be a very important aspect of our customer experience for the holiday season 2020 for the first time ever. And so we in, engaged a, uh, a terrific uh, consulting firm that specializes in the digital world, really smart in terms of technologies, understanding and road mapping the consumer journey from the time they you know pick up their phone and begin to order on Instacart to the experience of them uh, placing the order, driving to the store, um, arriving at the store, communicating. Uh, but we didn't stop there with the technical side. We re-engineered the actual physical experience of our internal employees who would shop for the customers. We empowered them with more, more phones and more tools to communicate directly with our customers. And then we backed up uh, the experience that we call the friendliest curbside experience in America. Love it. And we back that up by guaranteeing the accuracy of the products. We empowered our shoppers to provide special surprise and delight gifts to the curbside, like a bottle of water on a, on a hot day. Mm -hmm. and we even changed the experience during the holiday season. Again, we customers expect us to treat them really nicely all the time, and especially during the holiday season. <laughs> of course. Where they trust us with their shopping and their family, their family meals. And yep. so we had Santa Claus. So we had 
fully costumed Santa Clauses. Love it. From the boots to the <laughs> red suit to the hat to the candy canes, who were who came out and provided curbside service during the holidays. I love that. I and, love that. And so that was really terrific. Sales went way up, customer satisfaction went way way up, and then we were we were recognized by Winside Grocer, the friendliest curbside experience in America was recognized as one of the top 10 digital innovations in all of food service, retail food service. Love it. Love it. Well, the last thing as we wrap up this 10 minutes goes by so quick. Last thing I want to ask is, you know, one of our priorities is making, is spreading that brand love into the world of TikTok for 2022 for, for the fresh market. What's your personal favorite TikTok trend or hashtag? What have you started to play around on the platform and what, what pops out to you? Oh, I'm just, you know, I watch a lot of the NBA stuff. There. Awesome. You know, they, they really have brought the NBA experience to the palm of your hand. Yeah. So you get to, to see who's talking about and gossiping about whatever. <laughs> but you also, they really post a lot of the really key stats. Yeah. Uh, the, the key players, the historical players. So it's very educational, informative, and it's gossipy. I've gotten, I to the gossipy <laughs> point, I've gotten into some deep deep rabbit holes of nba tiktok where right. it's like p- former players like oh, kevin man. garnett telling stories about tim oh, duncan yeah, talking yeah. Cra- you know trash to him and yeah. just how subtle, like oh so many good stories that it's find funny. my way for, because i'm getting down that rabbit hole love to love to hear it well, yeah. awesome so Thank we had to tap into that humanity the human spirit and love that's the way to go i love it i love it well thank you so much and kevin. I know, uh, the marketers are we're not uh advocating our position gary <laughs> it's all about we the human brand marketers brand marketers that's brand right marketing. you better believe it right. that's 100 percent right all right thanks kevin thanks guys love that thank you mickey go thanks, enjoy man. go enjoy that porch will do that was amazing all right last but not least let's bring nick m up on the stage our executive hello, vice president hello. what is going on man. Nick, Hi. I love the fact that we're we're gonna have we're getting all the Greeks to unite here in this last conversation. The Greeks closing it out. I mean, That's right. now, we got, now we got a party. Manos and I are gonna break some plates in a minute. That's just right. Well, let let us let me just uh, set the stage a little bit for uh, for Manos, who's gonna be joining us. Manos Spanos, he's the president of El Nutra Consumer Health and Nutrition, and I'm really excited. I'm gonna be taking lots of notes during this one. He's scaling the company super fast uh, because he's got breakthrough science that's aimed at optimizing health span, curing disease, and extending life naturally. What, what better than that? Uh-huh, take. Oh I guess we're going to find out. All right. Take it away, Nick, and welcome, Mano. <laughs> hello, hello. What is up, brother? How have you been? All good, my brother. All good. Greeks unite, as you said. There we go. Oh, Greeks nice, unite. Nice, nice way to close the day. So I've been fasting all day in preparation for this. I feel really good. But why don't you ground our audience real quick on a little background on you, the company, for those who might not be that familiar with the brand. Absolutely. Um, and I'm sure a lot are not. So El Nutra. El Nutra is a little company that uh, is going to become huge in the next few years. So be on the lookout. Uh, it's the company that stole my heart after 20 years of CPG <laughs> career in J&J, PepsiCo, and Danone. So I progressively moved towards more healthy options. Um, and I think I landed in the healthiest one of all, which is which is El Nutra. And um, in El Nutra, we aim to add life to life. We aim to extend, to help extend uh, human longevity in natural ways. How the hell are we going to do that? Well, <laughs> by being in one of the areas that one of the things that we do every day, nutrition. What's the thing that you do every day, man? You eat, um, and you eat actually multiple times a day. So we're going to be in, we're in the world of nutrition, and more specifically, nutrition technology. Um, and the two first approaches that we have on how to do that um, is two areas. One, the area of how can you leverage the benefits of fasting, uh, but fasting with food. So get all the good things, and we're going to talk about that stuff um, around fasting, but do it in a way that you don't starve yourself, you don't go on a water fast, and you don't, you know, you, you don't do damage to your organs. Uh, so fasting with food. And then the second area that we are, uh, that we are working really hard on is the area of understanding exactly what is behind the longevity zones across the world, the areas where people get to live over 100 years uh, old, what exactly do they do in their nutrition? How do they do it? What is in it? What's the, what's the technology of takes off of that? And, you know, small spoiler alert, fasting is a key part of that too. So there you go. Um, so those are the first two areas that, that we're working on. There is more that are coming um, to, uh, um, at, the, at the other end with, with more technology, but this is the first two things that we're tackling. 
Um, and yeah, we do have uh, programs and products that actually work. Um, and that's what differentiates us. The last thing that I would say about El Nutra is it's the first time in my life that I've been in a CPG company that has already done 17 clinical studies, completed, peer-reviewed, double-blind, um, in humans, in animals, published in the biggest science magazines in the world um, to back up every single claim that we have. So we've done 17 and we've got 12 that are, 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 that are on their way. So if you find me another CPG company that has anywhere near that number of clinical studies behind the products, I'll, I'll join them. All right, so let's go with some hot takes here. Um, yep. Fasting as a lifestyle, you know, is this a niche? Is this a fad? Is this the next whole thirty? Like for the cynics out yep. there, what's the hot take? Well, if it's a fad, it's the longest, the, the longest uh, running <laughs> fad in the universe because we've been doing it since humanity ever started, right? First humans started fasting, and you know, for God's sake, take any religion in the world, you name it, whichever religion in the world. What are the two things that they have in common? You pray and you fast. So wow. humans always knew fasting is good for you. What has changed in the last few years is that we now know exactly what is the good that this does, which is the cellular rejuvenation, which is the fact that your cells are basically cleaning up house and creating new versions of, the, of themselves. Um, and we now understand how, what is the mechanism behind that, which is autophagy. Um, and then we now also understand how the hell can we induce that um, yeah. in a quick way in the body even though you're eating, you can still get in a state of autophagy, which will create all the uh, benefits of fasting uh, with food. So that's what changed. So for me, I don't think it's a fad. Uh, I think more and more people are realizing that what they've been doing anyways, whether they were part of a religion or not. By the way, every, every night you sleep, you fast. You have yeah. to understand. Like every night you sleep, you just fast for 12 hours. <laughs> the whole thing is how can you get this 12 hours to 16? And then how do you, can you go to prolonged fasting and do it over four to five days? That's the only thing, but you do it every single day. So it's, it's not a fad. It's something that people are realizing that, that it actually is helpful. And I think more and more people are, are jumping on the bandwagon. We've, we've, we're, closing, we're, we're closing towards a, a half a million people already um, going through our programs. So. And what have you seen so far as the biggest barrier for the consumer? Is it just uh, general knowledge, awareness? Well, the biggest barrier is the reason why um, I think Vayner is <laughs> work with which is how the hell do you explain to people that you can eat and get the benefits of fasting at the same time? It's just, it's just that awareness. It's, it's really, it's not an easy thing. It's not something that, I can, that we can do over 30 seconds of a TV spot, right? It's just yeah. not easy. So it requires a lot of education. It requires the health professionals uh, to educate people on, and we have a pretty strong health professional program. It takes advocates from all different kinds of, um, of, of, um, of genders to, to help us spread the message, educate, in, in non-traditional ways. So it, this is not going to happen over, I put a TVC up there and I tell you that this works. Tomorrow. This is going to happen by working with a lot of people to spread the word out there. Okay, cool. Jumping around a little bit. I know we don't have that much time, but um, no the concept of preventative health and longevity of life. I mean, that's a hot take in and of itself. Ground our audience, ground our audience. Yeah. Preventative health, what do we need to know? Uh, in, my, in my opinion, biggest missed opportunity in the whole COVID situation. Um, because we focused everything around COVID in the prevention through drugs, through either the vaccines or through drugs that treat the COVID, which is great. Thank God we have those. That's, that's wonderful. Nothing is uh, I'm triple <laughs> vaccinated, quadruple vaccinated already, so we're fine. But, um, but we missed a huge opportunity to talk about preventative, uh, preventative health, to talk about how can we prevent disease? How can we strengthen our immunity systems? How can we reduce obesity? And there's lots that, that are play there. We lost an opportunity in the world of, uh, of working out and fitness and that stuff. And we definitely lost an opportunity in the world of nutrition. And we're trying to spotlight that because yeah. you can do things through nutrition. For example, what we are, what we are saying is, you know, going through the, 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 the fasting for nutrition programs. So you can do stuff for your body and you can do stuff that strengthen your immunity system, that reduce obesity that curb the effects, the, the effects that obesity and other diseases have on you. I mean, it's, you can and should be doing that. So let's please not let this opportunity go by completely. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about nutrition. Let's talk about that role in preventative health. It's yeah. very important. And hot take on that is as the world opens up, goes back to a more normal state of people leaving the house where maybe it was even challenged for anybody to realize that while they were, we were all sitting at home, you know, um, 
how does it shift as people go on the go again? You know, you've been in, in food yeah. for a long time. The formats, the change from direct to consumer to now buying in stores because they're on the road. Um, any hot yeah. takes there? Yeah, well, I think we're going to see some of the things that happened pre-pandemic. Um, so the growth of the on-the-go, which was a pretty clean one, that's going to that's gonna start going up again for sure. I mean, you have to. Um, you're going to see, again, you're going to see a lot. And one of the previous uh, speakers from Fresh Market was actually talking about this, that the more technology you bring in, actually the more people want to go in the in the shops and, and, and shop yeah. and, and, and interact. So I think you're going to see a little bit of that. Um, but what you're also going to see, I think, is more potent solutions through nutrition. Things that actually work have a functional benefit. So you're going to see functional food growing, I think, faster than it had been growing before. Why? Because we realize now we are living a short life and, you know, this thing can happen anytime. So uh, the more you can do through your food to strengthen your body, um, I think the better it is. So you're going to see a lot of functional food growing um, yeah. at the same time as on the go. And as that takes off, does it have to taste like crap or can it be really good? <laughs> <laughs> Hot Man. take. Help right. me. Okay. So I want, here, I want it to taste I, good. I don't care what marketing research says. If it doesn't <laughs> taste good, it's not going to work. Sorry. I, I know people say I'm willing to sacrifice taste if it works. I, it just can't. Now, this doesn't mean it has to be done with sugar, by the way. There is, yeah. There's plenty other ways of doing it. But, man, it can not taste bad. I, um, and uh, we've, we've realized that. I mean, for quite a while, we had one version of our product, right? So it was the one version of Prolon that had this specific four or five soups there. So we're changing all that now. We're, we're adding a lot more variety, all clinically researched and, and backed. But people need variety. People need taste. Um, if it doesn't taste right, you're not going to have it. I don't know what it is. A hot take against that one. I go to the store now, and the amount of bars I see everywhere. Oh, shit. Like, we've reached peak bar. What, yeah, peak bar. What's gonna, like, what's going to happen in the bar uh, aisle? Or the yeah, it's gonna it's gonna explode. Um, <laughs> the same thing that it happened to the yogurt uh, aisle, which was my previous world. Uh, mm -hmm. There's just a point of saturation that that you know you know everybody smells money on on a category. Everybody rushes behind it, and yeah. and then you've got this explosion. And the retailers are happy to get you know another half a point here, another half a point there. So they'll bring in um, all, all this new variety. I think what ultimately happens, and you can see that very quickly happening also in the yogurt aisle. You'll see it in the bar aisle. What will happen is it will shrink, and only the differentiated players will remain. The top, the top five, six brands have no problem; they're going to be there because they have a reason for being there. But you, what you're going to see is very quickly consolidation of all the small stuff, and who's going to remain is people that are offering something differentiated, something that no one else has. Fast Bar, which is the one that we're having right now, and we're expanding at retail, and we're seeing an incredible uh, reception from retail. It is the only bar that you can have if you're intermittent fasting in the morning without breaking your fast. Right. Again, food, but doesn't break your fast. That's zero a hot take in and itself. Hey, zero <laughs> response, like continued keto production, you don't break your fast. So yeah. things like this, things that really have a difference will stay. Now, do we need 20 protein bars that have 15, no. 16, 17, <laughs> 68 grams of, of protein? No, we need probably two or three of them. So. No. Hot take, where, where is the protein threshold? Oh, like shoot. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll revert back to my previous world. Well, any, anything over 20, 20, 25 okay. grams. That, that's where, I mean, for, an, like for somebody that is working out yeah. in the fitness world and wants a serious amount of protein, I think 20 grams per serving, I think, is more than enough. All right, good. I'm learning so much. I hope the audience is too. <laughs> um, I think we got to wrap in a minute, but let's go. Hot takes yeah. in the world of media. You know, the past couple of years, oh, sure. it's the rise of... TikTok, Instagram Reels, trying to be TikTok, YouTube Shorts. How are you thinking about like the, the ever-changing world of media, the metaverse, all of that, and building brands yeah. um, all the while? One clear winner, one potential winner in the future, and then one that I think you guys talked about uh, uh, two, two chats back, but, but it's also yeah. very important. Clear winner on TikTok. TikTok is obviously winning a lot of, a lot of presence with, from brands and a lot of interaction and engagement. So that's a clear, a clear winner, not just that TikTok, the channel, but TikTok, the format of content. Yeah. Now we're using TikTok format to go at Facebook, right? So um, I think that's a clear winner, even though they're hard to work with, but you know, we're going to work on that. Um, so that's, that's a clear winner. I think a potential winner in the future is, is the metaverse. Um, yeah. I mean, what's happening now is in the borderline insane. 
right? With uh, between NFTs and buying S real estate on like it's it's just insane, but it's coming. There will be a market there. Now, how big that market is, I don't know yet, but I think there will be a market there. So I think definitely we need to watch out the metaverse. Um, and then the one that you guys talked about already is retail media. Um, it makes all the sense of the world. They've got the they've got the audience. They've got the better targeting. Um, I actually see them as a more effective tool for brands that are at retail versus the traditional advertisement on Facebook um, or, or, yeah. or Instagram I, because because of the targeting. You just you can do so much more with retail media. Um, so that's All my right. thing. All right, last one in 30 seconds. Hot take on the future of work, you know, because it's also the future yeah. of how we eat, where we eat. Um, how are you thinking about that, whether personally at the company or in the macro of civilization? All right, I think I think I'm in the minority here saying that there's nothing that replaces human interaction, man. You right. can't be doing this remote all the time. I, go go make a deal with somebody in the Middle East without having dinner and a shisha. <laughs> like, good luck with that, man. Yeah, that's not happening. Yeah. Go make a deal over Zoom with anyone in the Middle East. Right? <laughs> it's not. I mean, it just can't happen. And and it's the same thing in America and other places. People need human interaction. People need to see each other. Do we need to be five days in the office? No. Um, how would be three to three to uh, sure there's gonna be more flexibility for sure and that's great but don't tell me that zoom calls are gonna replace the offices forever because it's not gonna happen it's just not gonna happen people need to sit in a corridor and talk and chat and have a coffee and have fun and go down have a lunch and solve business problems on the go we cannot do that with zoom calls so i, that's I, agree, with you. I agree with you and i can't wait to see you um and a massive thank, thank you, you for running the show this has been awesome thanks nick can't wait to Thanks, live everybody. To 100 plus, you and I. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. That was awesome. Oh my gosh. I learned so much. We got to go Google a lot of stuff right now. I know. I know. Exactly. I know. Make sense of it all, right? This is life changing stuff. You're on fire. <laughs> all right. Cool. You and the, the Greeks. All right. Thanks, Nick. We'll see you yeah. soon in the office. All right. Thanks everybody for joining this, uh, this uh, extended marketing for the now. And I hope you're going to join us for our second anniversary edition in May. We'll be live May 26th at 12 noon Eastern time. So please come and join us. We're going to be talking, we're going to have a big celebration. We're going to be talking a lot about community and what it takes to build it. So keep the conversation going. Uh, hashtag marketing for the now, and I will see you very, very soon. Take care.